Everyone is doing okay today. Nice to see some familiar names and faces, but also welcome to those who I, yeah, who I'm not, not in contact with. So we're still at the two o'clock, 2 p.m. Eastern. Maybe I'll give folks just another minute or so and we'll get started. So I wanna be mindful of everyone's time. And also welcome, welcome. Great. And just to confirm with everyone, if you um if you register to um join us um that would be great or that that's appreciated um because then I have your contact information but if you've joined us and I do not have your email address already um please do drop it in the chat so that way I can make sure to send any follow ups um to your email so. Again, if you've already registered to join us for the Attachment Vitamins Info session, I should have your email. Um, but if you didn't register um, for the session, um, please, please drop your email in the chat so that way I can make sure to get the info to you. Um, or um, feel free to email us care at rescue.org. So I have your email. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Yes, please, please share. Um, oh, great, you read my mind. Thank you so much. Yes, please share your email. Um, I do not have it already. Um, so that way we can make sure to, to get you that, the follow-up. Um, again, if you did not register, so feel free to drop it in the chat um, or, or email us at careatrescue.org. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Karen. All right, so I'm going to get us started. Um, again, being mindful and respectful of everyone's time. All right. I'm gonna share my screen. All right. <laughs> Can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, again, welcome everyone for joining us today um, for the attachment vitamins information session. So my name is Lena Zahra. I am the program officer for um, within the International Rescue Committee um, and the Center for Adjustment Resilience. Um, and recovery. So um, we are here to discuss attachment vitamins and a partnership funding opportunity for our next cohort. Um, so please, um, you know, thank you again, everyone for joining. If you have any questions, um, keep them. Uh, I will try to do my best to monitor the chat, but also hoping to have some time at the end to answer any questions you might have. So a little bit of background about CARE um, for the Center for Adjustment, Resilience and Recovery. So it's a five year project in partnership with the National Child Traumatic Stress Network and is funded by SAMHSA. 
um, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Agency in the U.S. So really the work of CARE you can think of is working to support um, forcibly displaced um, youth and families to receive culturally responsive, evidence-based and trauma-informed services um, and interventions um, in order to prevent and address the long-term negative impacts of childhood traumatic stress. You can think of care as essentially a bridge between um, mental health agencies and providers um, and refugee providers to provide quality and holistic mental health and psychosocial support services. Um, the aim is that individuals and agencies, again, provided um, providing these services um, are culturally appropriate, not only um, trauma-informed and are guided um, by best practices. So an, a big component of that I would be, I would say is also to address kind of information and service gaps due to best um, kind of meet families and communities where they are. Um, a lot of the work that CARE does is um, centered around training, um, technical assistance, and leading culturally accessible um, evidence-based interventions such as um, attachment vitamins. All right, so with that in mind, leading into the work that we uh, are here to discuss today um, is um, attachment vitamins. And we work with um, our other NCTSC, NCTSN um, partners at the University of California, San Francisco, um, the Early Trauma uh, Treatment Network to partner um, and provide opportunities um, around um, facilitating attachment vitamin groups. So you might be wondering, of course, uh, more specifics as it relates to attachment vitamins. So attachment vitamins was developed by the University of California, San Francisco. Um, and you can think of it as a prevention, early prevention program based on uh, child parent psychotherapy. Um, and this is really key for burdened families who often um, aren't able to partake in really intensive interventions. Um, so these are um, evidence-based interventions um, that are relationship-based and strength-based um, for young children exposed to trauma. Um, so the overall goal of attachment vitamins is to raise essentially caregivers' awareness of the effects of cumulative stress and trauma um, and help and support the strengthening of the child caregiver relationship. So this is not a parenting skills group. It's to support parents and caregivers to learn about childhood development and the impact of stress and trauma, um, and to really provide the opportunity to, to reflect on um, their children's experiences and possible meanings of their behaviors and promote that secure attachment um, and safe socialization practices. Um, what you can think of as this of as um, something a question uh, we quite we get quite a lot is um, it's not actual physical uh, vitamin supplements you take, but you can think of it as um, as similar to vitamin supplements that you take to stay physically healthy. Um, attachment vitamins, the programs helps parents and young children have and maintain healthy relationships. It's like an extra boost of attachment uh, for parents of young children um, who experienced. Um, highly stressful and or traumatic experiences. Um, as you may or may not be aware, attachment is necessary for healthy development and growth, um, especially in the early years. So we're working on that almost like a group um, dynamic instruction around um, finding ways to integrate the knowledge that parents are already coming with truly um, to promote um, and encourage those strong um, positive relationships. Um, and working with uh, families that have children under the age of six. So this is about 10 sessions um, of curriculum content that can be done either individually or in group settings. Um, so we currently actually are working um, with part four partners right now who um, some are conducting in-person groups um, or virtual groups, depending on what is deemed the best approach for you and your agency or your groups. 
Um, and the ultimate goals, I would say, reflected in the different activities um, and then uh, reflection, as reflection is a big component um, of this programming, is um, the, having the ultimate goal and reflections increasing, um, as, we, as I may have mentioned, um, caregivers' confidence in their ability to care for their child, um, particularly in the context of chronic stress or trauma, um, and utilizing um, different activities, interactive activities and approaches um, that promote attachment, um, focus on caregiver confidence and warmth towards the child. So those are the, I would say the common elements and themes um, kind of interwoven in the different activities that are, are that take place within these groups. So participants, I'm, I'm in May, I mentioned, um, we're working with families who have children um, under the age of six. Um, in particular, this cohort, we want to be supporting families um, and children who have been uh, forcibly displaced, experienced forced displacement, um, really um, supporting um, culturally and linguistically diverse um, families. Um, and as part of, uh, let's say, um, participant recruitment, just thinking about um, what are things that we would be looking for um, in the applications. And ideally, you would be able to recruit in the community. So you would be planning to support and have a demonstrated history of providing uh, direct services to forcibly displaced families. Um, and this is by no means also limited to um, an immigration status. Immigration status will not limit or or facilitate participation um, in attachment vitamins. Um, in terms of the organizations that we would be working with, um, we ask that these are organizations that are US-based, um, so as public entities, nonprofit organizations, or government agencies, um, and again, have a demonstrated history of managing project activities and funds um, with the ability for that localized collaboration and, and coordination as well. So what to expect? Um, I started to mention, so you would be recruiting and obtaining consent from, uh, we say uh, around eight to 10 individuals um, for implementation. Um, this would then require recording and storing that informed consent. And then as part of the process of working with with your respective group. Um, we utilize quantitative and qualitative um, measurement and evaluation measures. Um, I do have to uh, emphasize that this is not a research project. Um, this is more, more or less to guide learnings um, and takeaways um, for really the group and, and also for UCSF and IRC. Um, so monitoring and evaluation measures would include um, pre and post administrations of the Kessler psychological distress scale, um, the tool to measure, tool to measure parenting self-efficacy and the parental uh, reflective functioning questionnaire. Um, and there's a short qualitative feedback survey as well at the end of the group um, sessions. And then part of this of course would be distributing and collecting on um, participant materials. So, we at CARE also are working to provide culturally and linguistically um, appropriate and accessible and validated materials to support that implementation that have been reviewed by um, bilingual and bicultural community members for accessibility. So that would mean having in the respective languages that let's say you would be having the groups in um, key concepts, handouts, slides, um, the m and &E instruments translated and validated in the respective languages um, as well. And then ultimately, we do ask that you would be able to um, identify at least two staff members who would be uh, trained attachment vitamins facilitators. So ideally, one is um, an agency staff member and one is a community member. Now, it's not required to have a mental health background, um, but it's ideal that at least one licensed mental health clinician is present or is highly skilled um, in leading support groups or similar services, um, just because this is a trauma-informed curriculum um, with an emphasis on self-reflection. So we'd wanna 
um, be able to ensure that there is some support that could be provided if um, participants uh, were in need. Um, and also it's important to have um, clear escalation and crisis protocols um, in place if also in need be. Um, and then also having someone is ideal um, of the two who's trusted in the community. So bilingual or bicultural for ease um, and comfort of the participants. Um, for those two identified facilitators, they would go through a 20 hour remote training um, that we would provide over four half days, um, either at the end of May or, or in June. And then those facilitators would then go on to facilitate that one cohort of eight to 10 individuals um, between June and September, 2023. Um, and then additional support that's provided from UCSF and CARE our weekly consultation calls um, with the um, so the consultation team. So alongside the time that you would be conducting the groups, we would then require you to join um, weekly consultation calls. So we can provide um, that technical assistance. Um, we can support you know recruitment, consent, participant retention, monitoring, evaluation of curriculum content and program facilitation. So these are certainly things you want to be a support kind of prior and enduring as well. Um, the individual awards will be up to 20,000 US dollars for each organization. Um, and typically that over the course of the four months <laughs> would include, um, for example, staff time, so facilitation, um, participant project survey incentives, so about 30 per participant per data collections, so that would be around $60 total, um, and then program materials. So printing, welcome kits, books, like we have a whole resource list that we recommend. Um, so these are just a few things that we like to share in terms of things to think about within what really what to expect in this, in this cohort. And then you may or may not have seen this, but this is the proposal guidelines in terms of how um, how to send an application to, to the CARE email. Um, I will, as soon as I'm done sharing my screen, I'll make sure to drop that in the chat. But as long as I have everyone's email, I can also email it out to the group again, um, if necessary. And just to flag that within this, um, so we have like a table of like, basically what we recommend to include um, in your application. In the annex, we even have like an optional um, submission template that most people tend to use of ease of just kind of um, really what to submit in terms of uh, the questions that we ask individuals to answer. And then even in at uh, including like a possible work plan timeline ahead of time. So you are also um, aware of what to expect. Um, and then also a frequently asked questions document that goes through a lot of different questions that we receive um, in terms of what to expect or what's needed, um, I highly recommend using that resource at the end of this um, PDF file as well. <clears throat> and also to mention this is, um, I will make sure to drop the link in the chat. This is on the CARE website under our announcements page, uh, page tab that you'll find at the top of the screen. So I know we're quickly going over this, but again, just wanna make sure we have time for me to answer. Also, any questions that you might have, um, but just as a reminder, so you would be sending the answers to the questions in the application to care at our at rescue .org. Um, The deadline is Wednesday, March 29th at 5 p.m. Pacific time, and we're um, expecting to get back to folks with a decision either way um, in early to mid-April, but hopefully the sooner the better. And likewise, again, I will make sure to email this out, also drop some links in the chat, um, basically our website. Um, we send all communications through our newsletter, which you can also sign up on the website. Um, a whole tab uh, on the website dedicated to resources. If you're in need of, of technical assistance or consultation, um, always fill out our form on the website. Um, and then also we'll make sure again to drop in the chat our attachment vitamins announcements page. Um, so you have again those details at hand. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see 
all of the wonderful individuals on the call. Um, and take the next 10 minutes or so to answer any questions. And um, like I mentioned, we'll be sure to um, also drop some links in the chat. And yes, I see someone messaged me. Um, if I have your email, whether you've registered um, or submitted your email here in the chat, I can make sure to get you those slides. Absolutely. Thanks everyone. As I get ready to also put some links in the chat, does anyone have any, oh, I see a question coming through to me. Would children that are removed to child services qualify as forcibly removed? That's that's a, honestly a great question, Susan. At this time, I would say, well, um, this is certainly a community in me. At this time, we're looking at those who might qualify as forcibly displaced as refugees, asylees, um, those um, that qualify as um, having been forcibly displaced from their home. Um, and, and also in the lines of kind of culturally and linguistic, um, uh, diverse families. Um, so I, that's more of kind of where, um, I would be inclined to respond to, but that being said, attachment vitamins cohorts, I know they do offer support, you know, um, to other groups as well, but I would say in this partnership with care specifically, um, it would be working with families, um, as I mentioned, that would be um, kind of considered um, refugees, asylees, um, families that have been forcibly displaced in that, in, in through the, that capacity, if that makes sense. So that's mean they are not including the, um, the immigrants? No. Um, oh, so you're saying for immigrant families? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, good, good. No, I'm not Susan. I'm just like, uh, after you answered the question and, and I had this question as well, like you said the refugees and the asylum. So how about the immigrant, like people who immigrated from, for, for example, from Africa and they came here, but they don't, they still like oh. need to please, um, navigate in the system. And if they have, for oh. example, the trauma and stuff like that. So those included or not? I would say so. So immigration status would not limit or facilitate participation. It would be asylum seekers, individuals without permanent status, um, refugees, asylees, survivors of human trafficking. So again, immigration status is not an uh, eligibility criteria. I don't know if that's helpful to you and Susan's question. Yeah, that's, that makes sense. Thank you. This that there is this um, particular interest in communities who face barriers um, mm -hmm. and accessing support. So not being able to speak English, um, not having culturally relevant services available. Okay. So you said the project is like uh, 10 families or 10 kids? 10, so actually I'm so sorry. So it was working with caregivers. So it doesn't actually, involve the children themselves it would be you would have, for example have two attachment vitamins facilitators come and get trained by our team and they would be conducting groups with caregivers and so this would be about eight we, we suggest eight to ten caregivers so it doesn't have to be eight to ten families if that makes sense eight to ten caregivers Perfect. thank you you may have covered this earlier, unfortunately, I was a few minutes late, but okay. do you have a number of awards that you are expecting to distribute? That's a great question. So we're anticipating up to five. So five organizations and partners. Um. Do you um do you prepare to work like with specific family like sorry um language group or it doesn't matter? Um, actually, we're quite we're quite open to um like it's not limited to any specific language or cultural groups. Um, for example, just based on the applications we got in the past year for the current cohort we're engaging in, 
Um, we have families, uh, we have a Swahili Congolese group, a French group, Spanish, um, Dari and Pashto groups. Um, it's just based on the, honestly, the application submitted. So it's not limited to any language or cultural group, if, that, if that's helpful. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm just wondering for, so I know you said that we'd get two facilitators trained. Do you usually have the two facilitators then do the group or the individual meetings together? Or does each one have like eight to 10 caregivers that they're working with? That's a great question, Marissa. So it would be collect, so it'd be the two, um, the, let's say the two, uh, let's say staff members or one staff member community member that you're working with, they would have one, one cohort, one group together of eight to 10 caregivers. So it's not, it's not be, it's not that the facilitators would have their own separate groups. The actual idea is that it's one cohort of caregivers with two facilitators. Was that helpful? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. So the facilitator can be uh, any staff, like in the organization. They don't have to have any um, like degrees and um, like for mental health and. Yeah, so that's um, that's a great question. So um, ideally, um, so we'd have ideally like one agency staff member and then one that's a community member. Um, just to have that connection to the community and, and of ease of comfort to the group. Um, but we don't require, um, let's say, the staff member to have a mental health background, but um, it is recommended ideal that at least one, let's say, uh, staff member that like could be accessible that has a mental health background, is a clinician, uh, could be present, or, or at least highly skilled in leading support groups or similar services. So they have that comfort and experience um, just because um, this is a trauma-informed curriculum. Things might come up, um, and especially in terms of maybe times of like reflection, um, you know, we're in a group setting. So we just want to make sure that the different agencies feel like they have um, the support, you know, in case um, things do come up, um, crisis protocols are in place, escalation, um, things like that to that extent. Um, I, but did that help answer your question? But it's not a requirement, although having access to that kind of background and support, um, or at least leading support groups similar to this in the past would be, would be great. Okay, okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm asking so much. No, please. no, 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 we have. No. I have to report it to my boss. That's why I please, just want to make sure. You do. And I am assuming your boss is Risha, who I admire so very much. So anyone and you all don't know, no, there's not no such thing as too many questions. We, we certainly welcome them. And I will drop it in again in the chat. But if you have also additional questions that come up, um, I'm putting the care email again in the chat. Um, by all means, um, don't feel like that this is it. I know things come up, questions come up. Feel free to reach out to care at rescue.org and we would be happy to answer any questions that come up. Definitely. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. We have a whole two minutes left if anyone has any other pressing, urgent um, questions? Not necessarily urgent, but since we have two minutes. Yes, um, of course. <laughs> do you have any case studies or just descriptions of how past groups have run, what the impact has been on the participants? That is a great question. I will say, so CARES partnership with UCSF is quite new. So we're actually in our first pilot cohort right now. So we haven't finished that. And this with this pilot that we're speaking of is for the second cohort. But I could ask my our partner, our colleagues at UCSF, if they have um, anything that may, they might be willing to share um, based on the groups that they've conducted in the past. 
Um, and I know actually the IRC has conducted also some groups. Um, so I'd be willing to reach out to my colleagues as well. Just through care, we, we wouldn't. Uh, we'll hopefully have that soon. We're, we're still in the middle of the first cohort, but I can surely share that out. That would be helpful. Yeah, that would be great. Um, also wondering if there's any way that we can get access to, <clears throat> excuse me, if not the full curriculum, just some of the more specific details, um, just thinking about staff capacity and if this is something that we want to prioritize internally, um, being able to learn a little more beyond what's in the application package could be helpful. Oh, yeah, I can definitely look into that. I know, um, to be quite honest, um, in the past, um, UCSF just acknowledging kind of how the curriculum has come into practice, like very much um, advising that it's like one set package and wouldn't be able to kind of extract or they wouldn't encourage or recommend extracting only a few sections just because um, they kind of supplement and complement one another. But Rebecca, I can definitely look in to see if maybe they would be willing to if they have some type of like overview or anything that they could share just so you can have a more extensive idea if you'd like. That would be really helpful. Thank you. Sure. All right. Well, I want to be respectful and mindful of everyone's time. I know that we've allotted 30 minutes. Um, so I want to thank each and every one of you of taking time out of your day to to join. Um, please, again, feel free to reach out to CARE if you have any other questions. My name is Lena. I'm always happy to help and um, hope to see you all in, in some of the submissions. So thank you again um, and hope you all have a great rest of your day. So thank you.